so thanks. So, all right, uh, my name is uh, Kenneth Gears, and I work for NCIS, uh, kind of like the TV show, uh, but not quite like the TV show. I'm going to give the first slide to the cyber czar. And this is not the American cyber czar, it's the Russian cyber czar. So I just gave this presentation to the, the Russian delegation and, and uh, um, the, the, the Russian cyber czar, his presentation was about that an asteroid is flying toward planet Earth and we all need to come together to save each other and the planet before it hits the Earth. And he's talking about the threat of the cyber attacks and, and cyber warfare. So, uh, but he's a great guy, and he stayed up with us till 3.30 in the morning, us researchers, a couple of nights uh, drinking. And so it was uh, uh, my experience at the NATO Cyber Center in Estonia prepared me well for the Russian presentation conferences, which are really quite a lot about uh, drinking. So I'm going to start in World War II uh, and just talk, you know, a little bit from the perspective of the boat. I think all of us are in the boat together, and that's what I told the Russians, and we're looking toward the future. Um, last year, I took my kids to this beach, Omaha Beach, and you're sitting on the beach. It's beautiful and quiet, and it's kind of hard to imagine that uh, not so long ago, really, it was the scariest place on Earth, uh, and it was sort of a, a pivot in history, uh, it, which uh, much turned. Uh, but this is a good place to start the presentation because you can see this superficial layer always has underneath it quite an important technical layer uh, that we can't forget about. So this is the first, uh, this is the ENIAC, the first electric uh, computer, uh, and it was built uh, um, in early 1940s, and the hope was that it would uh, calculate ballistic missile trajectories faster than a human could with pencil and paper. And it did. It worked very well, 300,000 times faster than a person with pencil and paper. Uh, and so. Uh, the, anything this powerful, you know, is going in the national security space to be fought over among, I mean, imagine a couple of kids with a toy, right? Well, imagine nation states with this kind of power uh, at their disposal. This is the Enigma machine, and you may also know about Project Ultra, uh, which was the allied effort to break the German codes so that we could see what the Germans' plans were during the war. Now, when Winston Churchill met the King of England after the war, he said it's due to Project Ultra that we won the war. Uh, and many analysts feel that the, the, the breaking of the German codes shortened the war by about two years. So a little bit on the history of weapons development. You know, you're trying to go longer, faster, farther from a safe distance. Um, you know, but Charles Babbage in the, uh, in the 1800s, he said, look, you know, um, there is going to be an information revolution that's going to change everything. This is the, on the bottom left, uh, one of his mechanical computers. Uh, and then in the 1990s, we all get this power uh, ourselves, at home, in our pocket. You know, now on your cell phone, of course, you've got more processing power than the, uh, everyone had around the world during World War II. So some people, you know, they shop online. Some people play chess online. Uh, there's a whole class of people around the world. When they look at the internet, this is what they see. They see uh, a zero-sum power game uh, in which you know they're constantly uh, trying to either take space or defend space. And this, you know, this the phrase the advanced persistent threat. One of the ways to think about it is that uh, a military or foreign intelligence organization has, or domestic intelligence organization, they have a job description, uh, which is to hack networks and to own networks and c computers. And if somebody dies or retires uh, or gets transferred, takes a new job, uh, somebody else is going to sit in that seat. And that's what really makes the difference between, say, a lone hacker and a professional organization. But this is the way they're looking at the internet. There's, there's leadership, there's weapons, there's media, and they're constantly doing national security calculations uh, around it. So we're just going to look at 10 things that I think are really important areas to look at about cyber conflict. And we're going to see what Sun Tzu has to say about them uh, and, and see going forward how we can use the art of war, and the art of war is a lot about peace if you haven't read it, and uh, Sun Tzu says war is actually the last thing you, you want to do. Uh, so first is the environment. Look, I think the internet is, you can configure it 
any way you want, right? It's artificial, it's made by people. And one of the, one of the things that is currently hot topic in international cyber conferences is the difference between maybe the, for lack of a better description, East and West today and how they view uh, um, a, a malicious cyber attack that involves code uh, that attacks, say, a device on the internet and malicious content which a lot of times when authoritarian governments are talking about a cyber attack, they are talking about content that they do not like, that challenges their government's position. And so this comes up quite frequently now in, in international cyber conferences, and it's something to be aware of. Sun Tzu says, this is all, these 10 quotes will be directly from the art of war. You know, it says, the natural formation of the country is your, as a soldier, best ally. So this constitutes the test of a great general, if you can understand and so forth. If you are a potential cyber commander or a hacker or a cyber defender, this is something <clears throat> that you can think about and take as uh, advice from Sun Tzu. This is the Stasi, so the East German Intelligence Service, and they're quite famous during the Cold War. They were the, the, the most rigorous, the harshest uh, intelligence service, and so every letter that would come through, they would steam it open and read it and steam it back closed. Uh, and this is the extreme end of surveillance. Um, and, and I think this is much more difficult in the internet era, but don't underestimate the power, I think, of governments and organizations, even though it's quite hard to do, seemingly, to duplicate that feat uh, with internet communications. So this is Burma in 19, I'm sorry, 19, 2007 when they had pro-democracy protests. The government just decided to turn off the internet for about two weeks uh, <clears throat> because as soon as they started cracking down on protesters, everyone's taking pictures with their digital cameras and flying across the internet and the government said, <laughs> you know, we are far behind in this game, uh, and they pulled the plug, uh, proving that the internet does have borders uh, that can be sealed. So here's just some thoughts on a cyber battalion. I'm working on this list with the great Roloff Temming, uh, the, the guy who founded SensePost and Paterva, um, and so we're working on a paper on this. Um, the top three, you can say, are very close to, for, you know, from a historical perspective, you know, you need intelligence, you're going to need special forces, and what, what, what you hackers call social engineering, I think, spies uh, who have been around for a long time, they know as human intelligence, right? These things are very close. Um, but the bottom four, you know, if, if, you know, if I'm the cyber commander and I need to get across a, a bridge, you know, I need a combat engineering battalion. In cyber war, I need somebody who can code me something today to get me across a digital uh, river. An infantry, and this is, Roloff is writing about this, a network penetrator. This is the equivalent of somebody who, who kicks in a door, who uh, uh, um, forces their way into a hostile territory. And then lastly, weapons. Uh, today we can see that information itself has become a weapon uh, and it can accomplish any number of goals, uh, pushing information out in terms of propaganda, and also even such as uh, critical infrastructure attack. It's well known already that you can, with code alone, you can destroy a piece of physical infrastructure. So I'm from a NATO environment. I spent four years at the NATO Cyber Center in Estonia uh, from 7 to 11, in 2000s. And uh, so this is some of the stuff we're looking at. How do we help NATO to secure this stuff? And you can get a sense of how difficult it is. So this is a, these are uh, a shot of the deployments in Afghanistan. Um, and you might not know this, but NATO has zero troops, no troops at all. All they are is contributions from the, the, uh, the, the nations that are part of NATO. So you put them all together on an ad hoc basis, and they have different languages and different equipment, uh, you name it, different perspectives trying to get them all to work together. Even the, 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 the most wizardly system administrator in the room, I think, would, would uh, um, have some difficulty here. This is Kosovo. So you can see there's 24 NATO nations and also 10 non-NATO nations that, uh, that volunteer to take part in this peacekeeping mission. Uh, bringing them together and letting them communicate with one another toward, toward some goal is quite difficult. 
I think to some extent it's important. This is the map of the world today. And I just want to give you a small bit of encouragement. I, I think that never before have you in your seat today have had so much power, right? Uh, you know, historically governments had a monopoly on the use of force, uh, on publications, uh, the, the telling of history. But now, not only do you get real-time information, but you can push it back and say whatever you want to say and write your own story. And so what this means is that I think you're going to see, we're all going to see in the next two, three decades, um, borders redrawn on this planet, right? Maybe green, not green, violent, nonviolent, uh, carnivore, vegetarian. Um, but the internet absolutely has the power to redraw borders. And so this is important time to, uh, to think about that. And I think this is a good map of the world uh, today. So two. Uh, Technology is moving so quickly. I think even if you are the director of the uh, most powerful intelligence organization on the planet, it is a difficult time to sleep with both eyes closed, is it not? Because you cannot be sure what your adversary has in terms of infrastructure, in terms of attack and defense uh, capabilities. Really, I mean, how many kinds of SQL injection attacks are there? You need to start defending classes of attacks. And also, reading Sun Tzu, who says, you know, there's a lot of great quotes in the book on defense, you know, this is a good one, you know. You know, the art of war teaches, you know, not to rely on the likelihood of the enemy doing anything, but rather on the fact that you've made your own position unassailable. And this is really, really good advice. So if, if you think about how quickly everything is moving in cyber, just in terms of infrastructure, but also attack and defense, you know, in 2007, the cyber attacks, basically, they followed the chaos in the streets. That came first. The cyber attacks came after. One year later in Estonia, most of the analysis was about cyber attacks supporting ongoing military operations. They were simultaneous uh, with each other. Soon after that, you have the Arab Spring start, in which most of the analysis is talking about how the internet and Facebook and Twitter are pushing the revolution. Right? And this is how quickly everything is moving. And I think from a national security perspective, I sit in Washington, you know, you need to think of the internet itself as such a powerful player. And that's why governments around the world who have poor human rights records, uh, authoritarian in nature, they are looking at the Arab Spring with great concern uh, because those question marks are going to get, that list of question marks is going to get longer and longer and the Arab Spring is far from over. So three, the proximity of adversaries, I think. Really, everyone is a neighbor in cyberspace, right? And so this gives extraordinary opportunities for attackers. This is, uh, this is a great time to be a cyber spy. Mostly about connectivity and, 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 and even closed networks um, are rarely truly closed, if ever, right? So there's always some kind of connectivity that can be exploited. From another perspective, cyber attacks have been compared to uh, aerial assaults or submarine launches, uh, special forces raids. The idea is to, to take advantage of surprise and anonymity um, and, uh, uh, in order to conduct an attack. Um, seizing cyber ground, I think uh, this is real interesting if you're thinking about traditional military doctrine. How do you take that hill and hold it? Um, in cyberspace, there's, there's really difficult to make a good uh, translation of, of the traditional uh, military requirement of taking and holding ground. What does that mean in, in cyberspace? In fact, it was almost always quite, quite different. Um, so here's a quote from, from, the, uh, from Sun Tzu's Art of War. And uh, you know, the general is great if you can design it so that the attacker doesn't know what uh, to hit. Uh, and and on, on defense, if the attacker doesn't know uh, what to attack, and this is this is good advice. Um, who are these guys? These is these are representatives from philosophy and religion and military and politics and literature. And all of these guys said something very close to the pen is mightier than the sword. So I think just as we should reconsider everything in light of the internet today, 
this old phrase is well worth thinking about. And these two examples we can look at are WikiLeaks and Stuxnet, I think. Uh, because uh, WikiLeaks has proven that the, the, the life term of a secret is shorter than ever, right? Uh, and this is great from a historical perspective. If your government is committing human rights abuses or uh, war crimes, uh, the idea that that is going to go undetected for very long is, is uh, increasingly uh, difficult to sustain. And, and uh, about Stuxnet is really code alone uh, has become a weapon. And these two things, in fact, have, I would say, even merged. And now you're never quite sure if, uh, if the information is a pen or a sword. But one of the ways to look at this is to say, Via the internet now, you can push everything out today. You know, if I were to find, you know, Obama's birth certificate or something, I can push it out and it goes to the entire world today to prove this or to prove that. Uh, or, or, and never before has there been anything like the internet to state your case, to make your argument, to convince uh, somebody of anything. And then in the other direction, you can say, who are my adversaries out there? Who's who the, you know, the girl I'd like to date? Who is the country I'd like to attack? Who is the, the party that's bothering me? And you can find their presence on the internet and attack them there. Uh, so in this case, you know, with Stuxnet, you're talking about one of the most hardened networks on the planet, and they know that every intelligence service around would like to attack them, and still, and it's not connected to the internet, and still somebody was able to get code inside internally on the network. So with, with WikiLeaks, there was a study done at the University of Colorado that said you know, there's a ton of great information from the uh, military side uh, to be published, particularly in Afghanistan. Um, but on the strategic side, you know, you'd have to count quite a few documents to say that there was a strategic uh, um, uh, paradigm shift, if you will. But with Stuxnet, I think it's quite clear. We can all see, and we've seen it in the paper recently, we've crossed a certain Rubicon there, right? In which, you know, if you're thinking that, okay, the lights in New York City could go out tonight because somebody on the other side of the world has, has hacked in and turned it off. Uh, I mean, we can blow something up. According to the New York Times, you know, they brought pieces of centrifuge and set them on a... Uh, uh, on the situation room table uh, to demonstrate that code can destroy something. So four, I think the unpredictability, we really don't know uh, where the internet is going. The future, I don't know if it's unscripted, but it's at least unknown from our, our perspective, right? And for attackers, I, this would seem like an ideal environment in which to operate. But at the same time, I think it's important to, to think that um, f from a hacker's perspective, it's difficult to know if, you're, if your attack is going to succeed until you pull the trigger. And you're never quite sure, too, if the defender might be watching you from some perspective and have a defense in place. Uh, and so I think from a defensive side, you can think about building some home field advantage around this fact, even if it's only redundancy, out of band communications, uh, in order to cross check information, the integrity of your network. Uh, so I like this, you know, the general should hide in the most secret recesses of the earth. And I think on the defensive side of cybersecurity, you should really think in this way. And how can I hide so that nobody will be able to find me if they come in, into the network, right? And so this is, this, is, this is important and this is really good advice. So uh, I was in Dungeons and Dragons Club when I was little. I'm sure some of you were too right there. Um, and this is what complexity looked like. And it was already very complex because there was so much imagination in it. And this is a true story. Uh, very quickly, I had a character die a long time ago and I was so upset about it. And I said, I said the character had a wife and uh, the, uh, the, they had a son and they're going to inherit all of the supplies, right? All of the swords and stuff. And, and the dungeon master looked at me and he said, I give that a 2% chance of any kind of you know, truth. And I, I took the 10-sided dice and I rolled a zero and a two. Right? <laughs> exactly. Um, but if you think about the complexity today, that first box of Dungeons and Dragons sold a thousand copies. Today there's 10 million users on World of Warcraft, uh, and accounts on World of Warcraft are often more valuable than uh, credit card information, right? Because you can sell that stuff for real money. Uh, <clears throat> And it's not just that, it's all of the stuff that's taking place underneath the hood, right? And one of the quotes that didn't make this 10 from Sun Tzu, he said, I can tell you who's going to win a battle uh, if you tell me the number of calculations each uh, commander has undertaken before the battle has been fought. 
Uh, and so here's Orville Wright in 2000, I'm sorry, 2000, in 1901, uh, and I'm sure he thought this was a fairly complex machine. And this is the cockpit of the new A380. And I'm sure that uh, you, it would be difficult to count the number of memory banks and processors and network connections in that machine. So and one more thing from Dungeons and Dragons, and everybody in here, we can divide ourselves into somewhere on the alignment matrix, and, and uh, if, you, if, you, if you disagree with my alignment, uh, you can, we can talk about it later tonight over a drink. But basically, you've got people there are trying to do good within the law, you've got people trying to do good outside the law, and then you have lawful evil, and this is, this is sort of like the 1984, or an, an evil repressive government, and, and worst of all, you have chaotic evil, like you know, the guy in Colorado who's not abiding by any rules and just wants to destroy things. You have this same kind of alignment on the internet. I think you have Skynet, who wants to take us all down, maybe in the future. You have the Khan Academies and TED Talks and Singularity University, you know, which are trying to steer technology in the right direction. You have Anonymous, who's trying to do good, but they're playing outside the rules. And then you have uh, North Korea, which is so evil, they are forcing their uh, citizens to use Windows 95. <laughs> So the advantage, there's a lot of talk about the advantage today uh, of an attacker over a defender. And there's a lot of truth in that for sure. Um, but I think to a certain degree, it's like uh, piracy. You know, it's, it's, uh, you know, hackers are like pirates and then they can catch you with your pants down, right? And they can sail away. And so the question is, is whether you can turn tactical advantage into strategic advantage? And I think the answer is yes, uh, but it requires you know, a sustained effort and, and uh, some history uh, and momentum on your side. Rapidity is the essence of war. You know, take advantage of unexpected routes and unguarded spots. And I think this is precisely captures what a hacker can do uh, to your uh, organization. So let's look at a current event, Syria and uh, see what's going on in the news today. Um, this is a shot from uh, 2007, and you may have seen this before, but if you're not familiar with it, uh, the Israeli Air Force bombed an alleged nuclear reactor in Syria, and it's widely suspected that uh, a, uh, a cyber attack played a role in taking down the Syrian air defense. Uh, and it doesn't take much thought to think that this is absolutely possible, right? All you have to do is your reconnaissance up front and figure out who needs to talk to whom at what time, and you can slow that process down uh, long enough for an attack to take place, especially in the Middle East where everything is, is a very small neighborhood. So here is an attack, and I like this. This is uh, the Syrian Ministry of Defense homepage. So it says, to the Syrian people, the world stands with you against the brutal regime, etc. All tyrants will fall. Thanks to your bravery, Bashar al-Assad is next. Uh, to the Syrian military, you are responsible for protecting the Syrian people. Rise up against your regime. Right? This is amazing, right? You're, this is, this is the, 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 the home page of your own organization telling you uh, to do uh, something uh, against your own government. And so this is, this is, this is amazing to think of the possibilities. Um, you might not know this, but there was a big uprising in Syria in 1982 in which about 20 to 30,000 people are estimated to have died. That's about twice the number of people who've died over the past you know, 18 months in Syria today. And nobody really knew about it because what? Because why? The internet did not exist. So here's quotes from the New York Times. You know, they cut all telephone and road communications and there were no reporters, right? So it took a long time for the information to filter out. So I visited uh, Hema, this is a picture of Hema, Syria. I visited in 1988. And I was walking down the main road in Syria, and as I walked, this guy started walking next to me, and he just started telling me the story of what happened uh, in 1982. And so, compare that to today, when if you uh, um, have you know, a Twitter account, uh, you can follow any number of, of live streams from, uh, from the, the scene of battle today. Very different. And one way to look at it is that transparency uh, encourages accountability, and accountability encourages responsibility on the part of governments. And the internet is going to play, and is already playing, a huge role in encouraging the responsibility of governments. And I realize this is not a great case study, but I think uh, the internet is ser serving, hopefully, uh, the people well. So 
flexibility. There has never been anything more flexible than a cyber attack, right? It's best thought of as a means to an end, not an end in itself. But on the terms of espionage, I am absolutely sure. I mean, I'm on the defensive side, but if you're a spy today, I think this is the golden age to be a spy because you can go out and pull down more information than you can ever read or think about. Um, the destruction of Stuxnet, I think the most powerful thing uh, is just using the internet, the amplification power of the internet, the peer review power of the internet, the network perspective to put information out there. I mean, it's just like uh, the, uh, the quality of, of encryption, right? You can't have something proprietary. You have to throw it out there and let everybody attack it and make sure it's solid and good mathematics. Um, from the perspective of the uh, internet to push propaganda. So here Sun Tzu says, look, five ways of attacking with fire, and you can think about a cyber attack as well. You can hit the soldiers, you can hit their transportation, you can hit their food, you can hit their logistics, you can hit their family. You know, um, he would be impressed. Here is a case of the, the uh, Chechen uh, uh, conflict with Russia in the 1990s. From the very beginning of the World Wide Web, they were pushing out propaganda, and then they were collecting money all over the world and then buying weapons uh, inside uh, the area of conflict. There's even publications based only on uh, Chinese hacking and, and, and cyber uh, espionage. And, uh, and this is directly sort of uh, feeding into a, 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 you know, this is not just in China, but around the world, militaries are collecting information so that when they go to war, they can actually shut systems down uh, and uh, to facilitate victory. Here's cyber war in Georgia. I think actually a better case study is even 1991. Uh, when the coalition, you know, defeated a million-man Iraqi army with very few casualties. I think that's when Russia and China looked, you know, and said, hmm, you know, we need to catch up with what the West is doing in terms of, of networking their forces. If you've seen this, we just had the 23rd anniversary of the Tiananmen Square uh, massacre, and this is the Shanghai Stock Exchange. It opened at 234698 and you can see the numbers. But basically, uh, the Shanghai Stock Exchange opened on the top number and it closed that many points down, right? So even though it was based on millions and millions of trades during the day and you couldn't possibly uh, arrange this, somehow these numbers showed up uh, to remind people uh, in China of uh, 1989. You probably saw this in the news today or yesterday, and the Iranian nuclear program is having more problems, and they, their computers are all going to max volume, and they're playing Thunderstruck by ACDC. <laughs> so a cyber attack is basically uh, anything you want it to be. And let's go back to Dungeons and Dragons. I think it's the imagination, it's timing, it's creativity, uh, but there is no one that is like there like snowflakes. So attribution, this is huge, right? Because you can't prosecute, you can't deter, you can't uh, retaliate if you don't know who is attacking you. Uh, and so the other thing about this is that the, the ease of entry onto the cyber battlefield means that the number of potential adversaries is much greater. So this is actually has a, a compounding effect on figuring out who is attacking you is not easy. Uh, I do think, though, if in the event we ever do see a real cyber war, uh, it will be clear who the, who the attacker is. Because one of the things that normal citizens don't think about is governments have a lot at their disposal. They have uh, signals intelligence, you know, they have human intelligence, they have money, uh, they have embassies overseas, etc., in order to determine uh, attribution. So this is a great quote from Sun Tzu. Uh, Wise general forages on the enemy, and one cartload of the enemies is worth 20 of your own. And this is perfect for cyber because essentially hackers are stealing the credentials of a uh, insider, right? And so then they kind of become a virtual spy in the other camp. And I think this is really important for system administrators uh, to look at it this way and to assume that they may have a a cyber spy in their camp at any given time. I think for traditional spies, this, is, this, this attribution problem is not so surprising uh, because if you, you've seen this, you know, this, uh, this senior Palestinian figure that was uh, assassinated in the Middle East about six months ago, you saw the, the team of assassins, they looked like a family from South Carolina out to play tennis. 
this uh, guy in Bulgaria the other day who was the suicide bomber on the bus uh, against the Israeli tourists, I mean, he, he, he had a Michigan driver's license. You know, he looked very nondescript, young backpacker. And so, uh, so from a traditional standpoint, this issue is not new. Most wars around the world don't have 24-7 embedded reporters. Uh, you, you, you really, there's a lot going on in the world that is quite low on attribution. These guys is a, uh, are the uh, uh, Black Hand in Serbia. Uh, and before you think that non-state actors aren't that uh, powerful, and they're even more powerful today, by the way, but it, this is in 1911, so they had played a critical role in pushing uh, the world into World War I, in which many millions of people uh, were killed. And also, by the way, there was a Black Hand 2.0 in 1999 when the, the uh, NATO had the war over Kosovo. There was a hacker group that was attacking NATO during the conflict and actually had some tangible, modest but tangible successes in their hacking efforts. Here's the EP3 that went down in China. And you had uh, um, patriotic hackers on both sides of the Pacific hitting each other. There was, there was hacker portals. There was a China killer, a USA killer. Uh, and, the, the dynamic here that's interesting is that this means that you all can play a role uh, in, in, in attacking and defending your country absolutely with no chain of command and, and no uh, approval by anybody. It's only your personal nationalist pride is offended, you know, and so you're, you're, you're out there uh, fighting. And from a national security perspective, from the government perspective, that means that you don't have necessarily have a monopoly on the use of force or on the level of tension or on the, uh, the uh, sort of the, uh, the range of diplomatic options, perhaps. So here's the, the soldier that was moved in Tallinn. And if you know this story, you know they wanted to move it out. Uh, and uh, the cyber attacks came back at them from, from uh, pro-Russian uh, elements. And, and the issue here really is pride. You know, I mean, if, if you know anything about Russia and Russian history, you do not uh, say anything bad about their role in World War II or offend them in this way. I mean, it's like you showing up and somebody's dancing with your spouse, you know, at, 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 a, uh, at an event, you know, you are not going to be happy. And so, uh, so the Russians were very upset about this for, from their perspective, very legitimate reasons. And so the point is, though, is there's a lot of nation state uh, hacking that could go on that is well outside the, the uh, the uh, sort of the purview of government, even within NATO. So you have the Greeks and the Turks. These are, these are hacker groups. You know, in Belgium, you have the, the, the Francophones and the Flemish, you know, and here you've got the Michigan and Ohio State. Uh, and there's no end to the divisions you can find in which you will fi um, probably find some level of hacking going on. Wherever there's tension in the real world, there's tension in cyberspace. If you haven't seen this, is very interesting. Uh, there's a lot between is Iran and Russia, uh, Russia and Israel on, in terms of conflict. And so you're starting to see people post their picture to the web and saying, hey, you know, I disagree with my government. I, I, uh, um, I don't want war. I want peace. So you can see that Iranians will never bomb you. And look at this uh, uh, a uh, woman from Iran who fired back, you know, we don't want the bomb, we want democracy, we're your friends. And here is a couple that found love and they're holding up their passports. Uh, so it, from a national security perspective, again, you have to consider the power of people and non-state actors to contribute to the, the level of, of tension um, that they would otherwise probably like to control. Cyber wars can be very quiet, right? You could imagine maybe a, a decent-sized conflict taking place via the internet that nobody knows about except for the direct participants in the conflict, right? Because there's no smoking hole and there's nothing, uh, you know, it's, it's really geek versus geek here. Um, and so the Pentagon is trying to establish some level of deterrence policy and they're saying, you know, we could imagine uh, attacking uh, back in, uh, in, in real and physical world for a cyber attack, uh, don't think we won't do it. But it's difficult, that's a difficult proportionality to work out. And when, you, when you're calculating sort of, especially the use of force, there's a lot of lawyers in the room and they have to really think, is this a proportional response to, a, uh, to the attack that we have uh, received? And what, one final uh, point on that, the private sector, I think, is probably absolutely not ready to deal with a foreign intelligence service attacking their network. And so if, if you think that, that these two countries might go to war and so they need to start undermining their electrical grids or their water systems, 
Um, this, this is an interesting point, and of course it's in the paper today as well. How much should the government um, uh, require of the private sector in terms of computer security? And it's a good question. So, divine art of subtlety and secrecy, we learn to be invisible, inaudible, and hold the enemy's fate in our hands. Um, this is really good. So, uh, I could offer you something here. I was at the NATO Cyber Center for, for four years, and, and next year I'm going to play maybe a lead analyst role as well in the 2013 uh, cyber defense exercise uh, that they're going to run out of Estonia. And five years ago, this was a couple of guys in, in beer. Um, and it has grown enormously. Now it's going to be the fifth iteration next year. Last year they had 350 people working on this, and you can see the level of detail. These, th this is built by the Swedish equivalent of DARPA here. They put together a whole uh, sort of model. Uh, uh, all these tables, there's I think 12, 12 uh, factories there. And the engineers in Sweden were quite sure that these, are, in terms of hardware and software, are quite realistic. These are electricity plants. And, and what we did was we ran a test and we, 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 uh, we said, okay, these are terrorist hackers um, uh, targeting these plants. Uh, so this is getting bigger and bigger every year. Last year they had 350 people and uh, so it should grow. So contact me if you might be interested in participating in 2013 cyber defense exercise. So Al Jazeera, um, The Economist, and uh, Popular Mechanics all very recently have had uh, um, drone-specific uh, reporting, talking about the, the, the evolution, you know, now uh, uh, the military has robots that can swim, slither, fly, uh, hop, and, uh, and they're also be being given some level of autonomy to make decisions on their own. And you know that it's only a matter of time uh, before you know, lethal weapons with uh, sort of autonomous thinking and decision making uh, are here. And if you haven't seen Ghost in the Shell, watch it because it's taking place in the year 2029 in which case you have a very powerful cyborg, uh, you know, this elite force. Um, but it's not just the, it's not just the, the um, the fear that, that this w technology will be abused or will even operate outside its parameters. In this show, they look at the, the issue of an unknown hacker taking control of that technology. So, you, so in theory, you have to think that a uh, foreign intelligence service would like to take control of your missile and fire it against your own city. And at least in theory, that has to be possible. So subjectivity. I think, you know, I'm on cyber defense at NCIS and, and the uh, um, there's just so much work to do. You, you, we have two lawyers that sit with us because they're, you know, they're trying to uh, uh, make sure that we you know, operate within the law. Um, but then everything from the collection of data to the analysis of data, uh, reporting, um, all of that, are there's huge obstacles in order to, uh, to complete any cyber uh, investigation. And in terms of uh, bomb or battle damage assessments, you know, you can say, well, okay, they came in and they stole all of our new, uh, you know, submarine data. Uh, they did. Uh, oh, that's terrible. Well, what did they, what exactly did they take? Well, we're not quite sure because it was all encrypted. Okay, and then they say, well, are they still on the network? We don't think so. You know, can they get back into the network? Uh, we're not sure. You know, th these are very common answers, right? And it's very difficult to know, you know, necessarily the level of threat. Can they make it, can they take advantage of that information? Can it be used against us? All of that information is very difficult. And it's from, uh, the, the, there's a lot of subjective uh, also thinking going on in terms of the, the uh, scale of the threat. And so effects-based, you know, well, if nothing happens in the real world, we might be okay. You know, if, if the light turns on every time I flip the switch, great. And if my pay keeps coming, Coming in to my account, well, I'm not going to worry, right? Because I can still buy groceries, um, and so that could provide you some comfort. But this violates the most important, or the, at least the most famous quote from Sun Tzu's Art of War: "If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles." And I think even knowing your own uh, network very well is a challenge enough, but your uh, uh, knowing the enemy is even harder. So there's a book I, I published last year. It's a free download from the NATO Cyber Center site. Uh, I look at four areas. Deterrence. This is difficult, very difficult, because if you, your, deterrent, your threat has to be credible. Uh, and it's not credible because of these twin challenges of asymmetry and anonymity uh, that take place quite often in cyberspace. 
arms control, if we can't prevent cyber attacks, can we limit cyber weapons? This also is very difficult because you need to be able to prohibit something specifically and, how, and it's very hard to define malicious code, so it's very hard to prohibit it. And then who can expect cyberspace? It's too big. There's 500 million computers in the United States um, that are uh, connected to the internet. Technology, can you develop technology to the extent that you solve these problems? And I think the answer is no. Let's give IPv6 the benefit of the doubt and saying, okay, it's a technical solution to a technical problem. That's great, because if you have a political solution to a technical problem, you're not really solving the problem. And let's say that IPsec and the infinite number of IP addresses will improve security because you can label things and you can track them and you can authenticate better. Uh, Vint Cerf recently said if he could do everything over again, he would put authentication sort of uh, on the top of the agenda. Um, but I think even if we had every solution, uh, people would then drop out of the system voluntarily uh, because we, we, we need some privacy, we need some ability to anonymize our communications because you're never quite sure if government is going to uh, be friendly in the future. Here's just one graphic from the book, but basically it shows that, that I looked at nine areas, five problems and four solutions, and, and I colored them by, uh, by influence and by, by hue here. And you can see that anonymity, I think, is the dominant factor in the system. And so if you want to change the, uh, the uh, um, dynamic of strategic cybersecurity, that's the key piece. You want to change the, the thing around which everything else turns, because if you know who the bad guy is, you can deter them, you can prosecute them and retaliate against them in theory. So then we come to Art of War. If you can't, if you can't do any of the above, uh, then you need to improve your doctrine. You need to realign your, your people, your training, and your practices in order to deal with this threat. And here I think the Art of War does provide quite a lot of helpful support in terms of objectivity, strategy, tactics, etc., uh, in order to guide your forces and morale and so on and so forth. Uh, but the battlefield, this is new. I think the, the, the new part is, is the, the, the terrain on which cyber battles are taking place. And this, this, is, this is new, especially there's a whole generation that's going to have to be replaced uh, before you get somebody in the White House you know, who, who really has a networking background and understands uh, code. Morality is the final one, uh, the final piece, and, and I think so far there's few inhibitions to cyber attack. I think we're all sort of at a place like we're in the Garden of Eden again. You know, the internet has sort of changed everything, and so we're, now we're all looking at these shiny, bright apples, right? And we're all really tempted, and I'm talking about, in part, uh, cyber espionage today, you know. There's such a high return on investment uh, via the internet, but none of us would give it up, because we've all benefited so much from it, right? From learning on the internet, uh, and and what, what we gain in terms of being connected to the internet. Um, and so far, really, the lawyers, like at the Cyber Center in Tallinn, uh, they would say, if nobody dies, this is not an attack, right? And this is interesting from the Estonian perspective. They're very interested in being a part of NATO and getting defend, you know, defense from the alliance. Uh, but attacks are different these days. Cyber attacks look very different than tanks crossing the border. Uh, but the lawyers so far are saying no. And, and actually later this year, I can put in a plug for this, the, the Cyber Center at Cambridge University is going to publish an update to the laws of war uh, based on cyber attack and defense and, and internet security issues. But I think over time this is going to change. Hopefully it doesn't. Uh, but if we see attacks that affect critical infrastructure and affect people uh, and their way of life, uh, then you will see governments come together. This is not without precedent, and these problems are not impossible to solve. Uh, hijacking, airline hijacking used to be a problem. Chemical weapons used to be uh, um, quite everywhere on the planet, and today about 98% of the world governments are party to the Chemical Weapons Convention, and so they're all being destroyed. Um, so it's really important to think about, you know, if, if the lights start going out in New York City uh, tomorrow, uh, you would probably see world leaders come together within three or four days and start to try and figure out some solution. Um, look at these two quotes from The Art of War. So, uh, supreme excellence without fighting. Uh, the best thing of all is to take your enemy whole and intact. So it's, it's wrong to think of Sun Tzu or the art of war as, as a, um, too aggressive. Um, in fact, uh, Sun Tzu says uh, fighting is the very last thing you should do. 
There is a whole theory around the just war concept, and it is surprisingly complicated. Uh, so let's also, like IPv6, give some of these things the benefit of the doubt and saying, okay, you could have a just cause. You could distinguish between military and civilian. That's really a key aspect. And of course, in cyber, that's hard. But I want to get down to the bottom. Uh, in particular, we talked about prohibition, but declaration of war. You might remember a couple years ago, the, the former CIA director gave the keynote at Black Hat in which he said that, uh, um, he said, why might it be uh, okay to bomb a factory, but not to hack it? Right? Nobody said anything, everybody waited. And he said, the reason is, is because you can choose to bomb a factory tomorrow. He said, you cannot choose to hack a factory tomorrow. He said, hacking a factory takes months, if not years, of painstaking subversion, right? And he said, if you think about this for the long term, uh, this is unsustainable, and this is a recipe for chaos, and a recipe for a lot of wasted time and money. And so he suggested a couple years ago that looking forward, we, that we might think financial sector, um, electricity grids, areas that we come that governments would come together and say are off limits to cyber attack. Now, it may not be uh, possible in your opinion, but this may lie in our future. Uh, but the problem is, I think a declaration of war or a declaration of surrender, very hard to imagine in, in, in cyberspace. Uh, I know these ones and zeros are kind of blunt instruments to look at these issues, but we only have so much time here. So uh, another area is confidence building measures uh, that, that, you know, this is what cyber diplomats or diplomats who look at cyber are thinking about right now. And th this is just stuff, five things that I put down uh, that are possibilities, but you may have your own ideas. Uh, but I promise you within the State Department today, they're, they're looking at these issues and wondering which ones are feasible uh, and which ones uh, we, we could implement. And so this, they range from a non-aggression pact uh, to joint investigations, uh, you know, you could imagine a, uh, an incident response team that is on call 24-7 that is staffed by, you know, one person from every country in the world. That would be pretty cheap, right, in terms of uh, human resources, but perhaps you bring them all together uh, and then it's quite a statement as far as uh, cyber defense. So we started with World War II, let's end with World War II uh, and keep our eye on the prize and, uh, and particularly peace and security for the future. Uh, and, and to the extent we must look at the art of war uh, to help us understand cyber conflict and negotiate cyber conflict, we want to think about where we're going and how to get there, which is, which is beyond uh, conflict. Thank you.